X-rated movie or any fifth-rate porno play, this is the show you want. Oh, it's absolutely marvelous. Probably, I'll be very insulted. Third time I've been to it. Marvelous. Absolutely. Most disgusting thing I've ever seen in my whole life. Not to be believed. Absolutely outrageous. It was divine. Fabulous. I think it's the future of city living. Um, fantastic. It was really fun. <laughs> divine. I love religious movies. It's a little gross, but I liked it. Well, it was uh, really the grossest film I'd seen. I think John Waters has got his <laughs> finger on the pulse of America. I think he's got his thumb Hello. securely up America's ass. Kill everyone now. Condone first-degree murder. Advocate cannibalism. Eat shit. Filth are my politics. Filth is my life. Take whatever you like. <laughs> yes. Born in Baltimore in 1946, John Waters grew up in a middle-class Catholic home. Not the origin story you'd expect of the Pope of Trash. Perhaps the dull, idyllic childhood caused him to seek out the counterculture, to fall in love with the drape scene, to romanticize the young man on his block who drove a hot rod. Waters started hanging around outside a beatnik bar in Baltimore. It was there he met his muse, Divine, and many of his future partners in grime. Inspired by relatively tame films like Lily and the Wizard of Oz, Waters nevertheless had a sick sense of humor and from an early age staged violent puppet shows satirizing Punch and Judy. It was difficult for a counterculture figure like Waters to break into the mainstream and his first official feature film, Eat Your Makeup, has never been shown commercially. Filmed in 1968, four years after he graduated high school, Makeup is a dark and satirical piece of work, and while it is by all accounts rough around the edges, it served as film school, and as a result, 1969's sophomore effort, Mondo Trasho, worked much better. Centering around the lives of a hit-and-run driver and her victim, Trasho is probably a little too long. Waters was eager to explore the narrative space at the time, but has claimed in interviews that the idea would have worked much better as a short. But a short wouldn't have taught him nearly as much about filmmaking, a 1970s murderous romp Multiple Maniacs did a lot with a $5,000 budget. Waters' early films were narratively simplistic and rough-hewn, but their real merit was in how much they upset the prevailing straight culture of the time. On-screen homicides were a relatively tame part of Maniacs, which featured full frontal male nudity and a rosary beat enema. Scenes so shocking they were excluded from a video release as late as 1990. Waters was finding his audience, and they were finding him and 1972's Pink Flamingo cemented him as a legend for all time. Shot for an estimated $10,000, a gift from his father, Flamingo's continues to discuss prudes and delight misfits, and it immortalized Divine as the filthiest drag queen alive. The film was so upsetting that theaters passed out branded Pink Flamingo's barf bags, and more than one saw use as the film contained some truly shocking images, including a throwaway scene at the end where Divine eats a fresh dog turd on camera. 1974's Female Trouble was more the same, and while it's not as memorable as Flamingo's, it's a more polished and better film. Water seems to delight in both high art and total perversity, and Female Trouble was his first real success blending the two elements. Perhaps the pendulum swung too far, however, and 1977's Desperate Living didn't feature much of his signature sleaze, nor did it feature his longtime collaborator Divine. While the film seemed to execute Waters' vision better than any before, it lacked his signature feel by virtue of the absence of his usual crew. Living was the first attempt to have the film produced by a third party, and while the film is considered one of his best, many Waters fans feel it lacks soul. Waters used the two previous films to find his center, and 1981's Polyester marked his transition to a more accessible fare. While Polyester itself wasn't the success he would have hoped, it was a telling prelude to his follow-up almost seven years later, Hairspray, a film that had something for everyone. Set in the 1960s of Waters' childhood, Hairspray is a morality tale about the foibles of conservative culture, full of catchy song and dance numbers and elaborate period costumes. His love of films like The Wizard of Oz makes sense when you see a film like Hairspray, his last film with Divine, but his first with Ricky Lake, whose career he essentially launched. Lake was back for 1990's Crybaby, his greaser musical about love that transcends the social strata. 
The film is cartoony, bubbly, and fun, and while it lacks the signature shock value of his early work, it showed he could play ball with Hollywood and make his satire subtle enough for the straights to digest. He was making the kind of movies he wanted to make, and he was gaining traction doing it. He was still possessed of a sick sense of humor, however, and 1994's Kathleen Turner dark comedy Serial Mom was a return to his dark and violent roots. It was his most effective skewering of suburban culture, and perhaps in the name of fairness, he turned his gun sights next on New York's snobby art culture for 1998's Pecker. Pecker railed against pop art culture, and for the first time showed the charming side of suburban life. If Pecker felt a little bit autobiographical, 2000's Cecil B. Demented was a lot autobiographical, detailing the exploits of a group of underground filmmakers who kidnap an A-lister and force her to star in their movie. Waters had an even harder time getting films made than this group of kidnappers, and the nostalgic view he takes of the underground indie roots was a welcome follow-up to the cynical Pecker. 2004's A Dirty Shame was an excellent capper on his feature film career, and was as absurd as Serial Mom, as raunchy as Pink Flamingos, and as funny as anything he's done to date. Though it isn't technically a feature film, it's worth noting that in 2015 he shot a project called Kitty Flamingos, a table read of the notorious script with all the parts being read by children. The project promises the script is kid-friendly, and to the extent that's possible, it seems like a very John Waters thing to do. Who doesn't want a kid's bop version of a film that features lines like, Do my balls, mama! These days, Waters can be found touring to promote his book Mr. Know-It-All, sporting his signature pencil-thin mustache and looking, as he says, like a total pervert. Whatever is next for the Prince of Puke, you can bet his loyal fans will be along for the ride. The Pope of Trash, Maryland-born John Waters has certainly disgusted many, but also influenced some absolute greats, such as David O. Russell and Jim Jarmusch. Welcome back to Director's Cut. I'm your host, John Dunning, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host tonight, Mr. Jason Alt. Hey, everybody. Thanks for coming back. Absolutely, Jason. This one was very interesting. John Waters is, you know, I, I have to say, not for everyone, not for most, uh, He's definitely not for the faint of heart, except maybe his, his second half of his career. More on that later. But to honor the, the man with the pencil-thin mustache, I am joined by my special guest, and that is just uh, the pinkest rosé from Airfield, San Giovese. Man, uh, what, what do, you, do you have a, a special... The best will $7 can buy. Good. That's Good so... on you, John. It smells John like... Waters would really appreciate the effort. This is what I imagine Divine kind of smelling like. Uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see. The, the verdict is out. Uh, you're going to but... need one of those pink flamingo barf bags if you're going to drink that whole bottle. I might just uh, puke right back into the bottle. Uh, do, you, do you have a special guest tonight? <laughs> this monstrosity in this uh, tiki glass here is a mixture of Di Sereno and Cherry 7-Up, which I think, uh, I think John Waters would really appreciate. And uh, the drink tastes... Just like it's uh, it's two constituents. It's you know it's it's better than the sum of its parts. It doesn't taste like anything that it's not, and it's sort of like a collaboration between Divine and John Waters. I, I feel like he would really appreciate a beverage like this. Perfect, uh, Lachaim. Hmm. Prost. I'm gonna need this whole beverage for this episode. I'm gonna need less. Oh boy. Well, this is all for you, Mr. <laughs> Waters. <laughs> Talk about a, a person that started from literally nothing. He, you know, was was renting these 16 millimeter cameras and just kind of shooting his friends, kind of, kind of like the you know people that we've talked about in the past, where he had a set troupe. Uh, we've mentioned Broken Lizard in the past, like that comedy troupe, or, or even Jeremy Saunier making Blair. Influences for for someone like John Waters came from a place where you probably didn't expect. It, a, a lot more wholesome than than someone that was was responsible for pink flamingos maybe he was just bored with what was going on but the the, the most wholesome of influences were you as surprised as i was uh actually yeah because it, it seemed like he would have seen some shocking stuff that but it really i think everything that was like weird and askew and like homicidal and like perversely sexual uh, i think was all his spin so it's sort of like he took these kind of like wholesome influences and just like twisted them but, you know, like maybe in, in a good way, he's fascinated with uh, with murder. He used to watch porno movies uh, with binoculars with no sound <laughs> at the, you know, over the fence of the drive in theater. And uh, he used to go to junkyards to see cars that people had been killed in. You right. know, 
Yeah, he was he was definitely obsessed with car crashes, and, and the uh, I just, I remember you know his his parents would take him to the to the doctor and said you know is there anything that we should worry about or do about this and they're like take him to a junkyard, <laughs> and he it's not like he wanted it. he's like uh, you know getting killed in a car crash is is the lowest way to go so he just was always you know uh, influenced by these. These murdered Novelias uh, th that would come in strong later on in, in his career was something like a serial mom. But yeah, I mean, th these really wholesome things until Andy Warhol and the Kuchar brothers, like George Kuchar, hold me uh, while I'm naked, really kind of... Uh, steered him in a way and, and made it show possible that you could have these movies that were interesting visually like a Andy Warhol film but also had this this narrative and could be perverse because you think about this in the 1960s and even in the 1970s this is when kind of you know porn was went mainstream uh, you know it, deep throat all that was happening and I think it really you know he, he loved the cinema but he also liked that risque side of it as well even though he he had such a humble beginning yeah and, and as much as his beginnings were humble he grew up in like the 50s and 60s in in baltimore and that was when sort of like the greaser kind of drapes movement was going on and all that music from that era was like you know he was in a <laughs> he was in a, a car crash and died, or he's in a motorcycle crash and died. Yeah. You know, the music romanticized that sort of like live fast, die young kind of stuff. And he had a neighbor who had a hot rod. And uh, if anything is going to be, you know, responsible for you having a fascination with car crashes and, and mortality, it's that sort of time period growing up and he you know kept going back to that in his in his movies he found his troop early like he, he, these were all his his friends and he was just you know for all intents and purposes just fucking around with a video camera and started filming things uh you know he met up early with uh with divine and mink stole and uh mary mary and Viv vivian pierce those two would would were the only two that were actually in every single one of his films and they were all this was all pre-hippie era uh it was all like basically beatniks where they were just all you know dressed in black hang out in coffee shops smoke smoke cigarettes with the cigarette holders and, and smoke a lot of dope and and that kind of fueled him creatively and, and the, the people around him he found that this kind of troop and and he had so much faith in them to do these outlandish things at a very early age but they how much trust they would have to have in him because they literally did anything that he, he asked them to do yeah i mean you, <laughs> charles manson is a, a funny way to put it right right his obsession I, with manson too i mean he was he wasn't even quiet about that but that's like the one of the most charismatic uh you know homicidal maniacs ever yeah what do you think about it like he couldn't just do what he wanted. He had to get people to do it for him. If what you want to do is make movies about it, if John Waters had turned into a serial killer, A, nobody would have been surprised. <laughs> Still. But right, as morbid as he was in school, like yeah. just just being a little bit askew and just being part of that, that counterculture, trying to uh, upset people. If he had turned into a serial killer, fine, but he could have done that on his own. The fact that he needed other people to help execute his vision um, just showed how charismatic he had to be. So, yeah, this is sort of like a, a Charles Manson type, but instead of like uh, killing people, he uh, killed them on screen. Yeah, and, and he and killed I, it as a director, if you ask me. I think he really lucked out, too, because he had, you know, everything kind of lined up for him in the early years as far as support goes. You know, he says his film school was the person that he would he, he would shoot everything on this little camera. You'd bring it and, and they would kind of cut it for him. And that guy, even though he was like appalled by the, the, the footage and the content that he was bringing in, he saw that John was was such a a great businessman and a, and a really talented filmmaker, no matter what the content that he was showing. And he really took the time and, and molded him to make something that was a little bit more, more cohesive. Because, I mean, if you watch something like a Eat Your Makeup or a Mondo Trash Show, it's basically silent films, even though it has some music and, and some, you know, it, it's just very non-linear. There's, there's no real story there. But you could tell the more outings he had, even though that everyone kind of hangs their hat on like a pink flamingos or, or a hairspray. I think every single outing, he was kind of ratcheting up the skill and tightening it up. 
I, I think uh, you know those those films were his film school. You know, he got it like perfected. I think Pink Flamingos is like the first movie that really hung. But I, I thought Multiple Maniacs. Uh, if you wanted to consider that his first movie, it's actually not that bad a first effort, really. You know, um, for someone that basically had no help from like the mainstream, right? He had to like do the premieres of his movies in, in churches. He had to like paper the neighborhood like a bad band to get people to to come to the film premieres. Like, and it was all on a shoestring budget. Nobody wanted to to help him at all. You know, like as far as like venues and stuff like that. You know, he he really had to work hard because when you're trying to be subversive, you're basically trying to go outside the establishment. I don't know. Like (laughs) you don't get any help from the culture when you're counterculture. Right. So he had to he had to work harder than almost anybody. You you think of like Kevin Smith, you know, having to lie and work at RST video (laughs) to get the you know, to get the space to shoot clerks. You know, uh, this is sort of like that. Some people, some people like did real well in film school and, you know, they had professors help them. And some people wagered their last ten thousand dollars to to make something real weird. So I think the fact that he had to work so hard shows how charismatic he was because he had to basically convince people to let him make movies that were not for anybody it, on purpose. Right. Like he, he tried to make the most unpalatable films and you know may, maybe you, you could argue later on i think w- where a movie like a pecker or even hairspray they have these social commentaries to them and i think that he was more cognizant of that as he kind of grew as a filmmaker over over the years but at first he, he you could see interviews featuring him and he literally just said he wanted to just show shock and awe and eat your makeup uh divine plays jackie o you know, reliving the whole Kennedy assassination, which is that that was the one that his mother said. I, I saw an interview said that one really broke her. His parents are like the sweetest. Like if you ever could see in- interviews with John Waters' parents, they they were just so damn supportive. Um, you know, he went up to 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 dad and he's just like, hey hey dad, I want to make a film. Uh, I need ten thousand dollars, and and his dad's like, no, I, I don't think that's gonna work. And he's just like, oh come on, uh, all the brothers and sisters, that that's the amount of money that that you uh, put up for college. This is what I'm gonna do, and, and he got it. And then he made much to his father's and his family's domain. He made pink flamingos, which, like you alluded to earlier, they showed in churches. So it was like all, all these things just sound so bizarre and so so insane that they happened, but. I think that it just goes back to how charismatic and just how talented he must have have seen how how everything was so put together. I mean, you see, you know, David O. Russell, uh, David O. Russell film like um, like I Heart Huckabees and you have Lily Tomlin screaming like he doesn't know what he's doing. And that was a few movies in where everyone, you know, John Waters just had this crazy like magnetism. To, to everyone he met and everyone was just willing to to do everything from be in his films, show his films, even though they hated the content or eat dog shit. It's just it's <laughs> unheard of. But uh, yeah, yeah, I think the Charles Manson comparison is perfect. But I think if you look at the later half of his career, the films he made later seemed more like the films he was inspired by. So as much as it's like, oh, I, he got the troop to do what he wanted. I feel like the troop steered him a little bit. I feel like he was influenced by the kind of stuff that like David Lockery and married Vivian Pierce and, uh, you know, Mink Stoll and uh, Divine more than anybody wanted to make, you know, once he sort of stopped working with uh, some of those people, the movies he made really changed. Right. Because, you know, David Lockery was front and center in Pink Flamingos, Multiple Maniacs and Female Trouble. Yeah. You know, with that just that weird mustache. Do you enjoy being in John's film? I enjoy being in them, but I don't enjoy making them so much. I don't. I love it once it's done. That's why I like movies better than I like plays because I can never see a play that I'm in, or I can never see me in a play. But I can go back and see what I did that I liked in a movie, and then change it. And I can't do that on the stage. And I don't like the work that's involved in making a movie. I enjoy it when it's happening, but all the preparation and the delays. Or no fun, but once it's finished, it's all gravy from there, sort of. <laughs> and then, 
he didn't make a movie after Female Trouble. And, uh, you know, Divine only made two more. You know, uh, so it, it, it feels like there was sort of a shift when he stopped working with as much of the troupe. What he made was different. So I'm sure he influenced them a lot. But I, I think just the weird shit they would talk about when they all hung out, you know, the stuff that they all could bond over. Because he wasn't the only weirdo. They weren't like, oh, we want to make a movie about trapeze artists. He's like, well, how about a car crash <laughs> where someone dies? And they're like, yeah, we could do that, too. They like the same weird, dark shit. And that's why they worked so well together, because that was what they were all about. But as much as John Waters likes that weird, morbid crap, if you gave him an unlimited budget, he'd make Crybaby, you know, instead of <laughs> he would make a better Pink Flamingo. So I, I think that's... It's really interesting that once he sort of severed ties with some of those people, the real John Waters came out and everything before was film school. Sure. So, so you think that if he had the means to make those those latter films back in the day or the experience, he would have been doing that instead of doing these crazy outlandish things? I don't know. Maybe he needed to get out, that out of his system and sure. maybe that kind of thing was part of his upbringing. I think if John Waters hadn't had to hustle, maybe he wouldn't have gotten – honed as a director right right like if he hadn't had to sacrifice so much and eat metaphorical dog turds <laughs> maybe yeah. he wouldn't have made anything good maybe he never would have had the balls to make a big gay musical right like <laughs> let alone two of them so uh i think everything i, I think you don't want to start playing around with what ifs because like everything that happened made him the filmmaker it did like you said, like-minded people, and they just, they all were, I wouldn't say good actors, great actors, none of that, but it was, they were perfect Dreamlanders, and they were perfect John Waters actors. I mean, every John Waters film, you know, Hairspray and, I would say actually before Hairspray and, and earlier, all has these signature just long, screaming John Waters-esque dialogues. You know, Mink Stahl in, in Desperate Living in the, in the beginning is, is probably my favorite, where she's just screaming at the, the children because they, they hit a, a, a baseball into her window, and she's, you know, I hate the Supreme Court. And I hate the Supreme Court! Go home to your mother! Doesn't she ever watch you? Tell her this isn't some communist daycare center! Tell your mother I hate her! Tell your mother I hate you! It's just all, all of it is, you know, or, or uh, when they're in, in Pink Flamingos and they're down in the in the base or the dungeon or whatever where the where uh, Mink Stoll and, um, and David Lockery are uh, stealing women's babies that they kidnapped to sell to lesbians and they're just, you know, just screaming at them. Um, they all have these, like amazing deliveries, but it wouldn't work in any other thing. Like, you know, I, I know Mink Stahl has a couple other acting credits. It, she, she did a couple other things that weren't connected to John Waters, but nothing prevalent. You know, she wasn't, these, these were never meant to be huge name actors, you know, for shit's sake, Edith Massey, he found it at this dive punk rock bar and just like, Hey, do you want to be in this movie? And she's, you know, the, the least, actor looking person that you'll ever meet and, and she, but she's perfect she's perfect in uh, desperate living she's perfect in in pink flamingos and, and it just worked and and i think that there's there's a real fair comparison that the, he was the 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 jackass of the 1960s where they were just trying to push the envelope uh shock the audience get a response get a visceral a visceral response and try to get the audience their money's worth and i think they really achieved that and don't forget, when he made Mondo Trash Show, he was 23 years old. Mm -hmm. You know, it, he's not going to necessarily come out of the gate swinging super perfect, especially, you know, since he was real immature and didn't really know which of his impulses he, he wanted to film, you know? Yeah. Like, of course, he got better as a director because he got better as a person also, you know? This is just like a bunch of young kids making weird shit you know and like really upsetting people but like everybody does stuff like that stunts you know everybody has their group where they just like get up to hijinks but this hijinks was like affecting people 
on a just a much bigger scale. Yeah. Like when they all got together, like what they made was like movies that are holding up. I didn't do anything like that in my early 20s, you know, <laughs> they just dicked around. So like we really think about it. It's a, it's amazing that they pushed each other so hard that what they were doing was not good, but it was effective. And, and influential, like, you know, a lot of these these uh, bigger filmmakers of today saw that saw that there was someone that was out there willing to kind of take it one step above uh, the, the Kircher brothers and, and anger and just really showcase trash for, you know, for lack of a better term. But I, actually, it's the perfect term. They just wanted to, you know, they. He, he shot everything in Baltimore, so everything is kind of a a love letter slash uh, indictment, I think, of, of the Baltimore scene. Um, and, and, you know, he's gone on now. He, he's more advocating towards, uh, you know, like gay rights and, and all that. He, he's more involved in, in these type of pride situations. But back then, he didn't use any of that as he, as like a way to further the movement i guess like he really put it on display like like part of you know in multiple maniacs when they're when they're discussing what's inside this tent he's just like yeah and come watch two queers kissing two actual queers and that's that he he said that as like a freak show so he was putting all these just like even if they weren't just like the worst you know things like like fecal in in ingestion just stuff that was not square back in the day and, and just showcasing that and just literally rubbing everyone's face in it and, and to where people either were just like really inspired by it or they were just like passing out in the theater but like either way what they were doing mattered like somebody needed to do what they were doing right you know so the you know the fact that it came out of the beatnik culture which was you know the like the main counterculture of the time like it, it made sense, and and as much as like none of what they did was beatnik shit, you know, <laughs> yeah. like Multiple Maniacs wasn't a beat movie, no. But at the same time, like they used that scene to find each other, and then they sort of just did their own thing, which I think is fantastic. You know, like uh, I mean, Pink Flamingos was a movie that was made to upset people. Why wouldn't you let your parents? In? That's torture. That's parents' abuse. What parent? would be proud their son made pink flamingos. Really? I mean, the people's divine parents, how liberal can you be? You're in drag eating dog shit. You know, that's, Dr. Spock didn't tell you what to do in a baby book for that. I get why his parents were uptight. That was the point. Because they thought upsetting people was funny. Because it is. Yeah. Because you're not upsetting just, you know, you're not upsetting the downtrodden. You're not making, you know, <laughs> the misfits lives worse. You're making the people that terrorize everyone else kind of feel as uncomfortable as, you know, uh, a gay man from Baltimore or a drag queen or, you know, some crazy beatnik. You know, they feel just every day in their own skin making flipping it on people. I think was important to them, making everybody else feel as uncomfortable as they did. And uh, I think that's I don't know. I don't want to talk too much about like this as an artistic movement or whatever, because, you know, they're just movies. But at the same time, I, I think the reason they wanted to shock people makes sense to me. Yeah, absolutely. And even so, I, I think. If you look at even Crybaby or, or Hairspray, it has it's carrying kind of the same message as a Pink Flamingos, where Pink Flamingos is just, you know, it's the tale of these two uh, groups where they just want to be the trashiest people or multi multiple maniacs is, is going from town to town uh, as, as this uh, carnival, but they're really trying to just, like, murder, like, squares and, and all that, but... but then you, you you flash forward and you go to hairspray, but it, it's the same thing, right? They they it was uh, they're trying to end segregation. Uh, yeah. So it, it's the same message, just just where I think, like you said, at at that time, it was perfect that he had to tell it in such a shocking way to just get out there and explode onto the scene. Because I think if he made hairspray back in the '60s, you know, kids would have bopped to it, but I don't think it would have had the same 
in, you know, social impact, whether he wanted to or not. Because like I said, he was like, I, I just want to make shock and awe films. And it worked. And I think that is what gave him the carte blanche to to make the movies he really wanted to make later. But, I mean, you have to, as much credit as, as John Waters should have, I mean, I don't think he would have been as successful or even successful if he didn't find his muse very early on. And that's divine. I mean, divine, you know, we, we talked about pissing off a, a, a one subculture uh, of, you know, more straight laced folk divine pissed off everyone. I mean, he, he really scared, scared the crap out of not only, you know, straight laced people, but other, you know, drag Queens and everybody of that, of that time. I mean, he was, he was the most beautiful monster that was ever constructed to where, you know, the hairline was shaved all the way back because they all stated that there's not, you know, physically on the human head, there's not enough room for, for divine's eyebrows. So they shaved his head all the way back. Um, it, so all, all these things were, were meant to not just be unsettling and rattle the, the, the normal, you know, straight laced nine to fivers, but literally everybody. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I really think if you had made hairspray in 1970 for like 10 grand, you couldn't have marketed that. Right. The fact that they made trash that upset people and then they got bad reviews and those bad reviews drove the kind of people that hear a bad review from some straight laced film critic and like, well, I got to check this out. You know, they're. There's they reveled in those bad reviews early on, you know, because that was the best press they could get because, you know, someone's like, oh, this guy's telling people to go see, you know, old yeller or whatever. And then he says this film was the most shocking and disgusting thing he's ever seen. I have to go see this. So I, I think making the trash early was how you build an audience, you know, and, and by the time he was ready to be taken seriously, he had some films under his belt and he had built a fan base. And like you can't get fans of Crybaby to, to see female trouble necessarily. <laughs> but the reverse order was much easier because people were willing to go with him. And I think people that knew he was the guy that made Pink Flamingos when they saw Hairspray, I think they got how cynical it was. Right. Because as much as like as much as any film he did early, Hairspray and Crybaby, and I guess Serial Mom too, they really subverted the dominant culture at the time. It was sort of like, okay, you squares are in charge, but look what pieces of shit you are. Look what hypocrites you are. You know, both Hairspray and Crybaby really are movies about how the dominant culture was hypocritical. And, you know, they they beat them at their own game versus like, oh, let's just cut these people's arms off. So <laughs> I, I think he got a little bit better at getting his message out there. And I think he built a fan base of people who trusted him. And I also think he got some people who didn't really realize they were being skewered to like his, uh, you know, bubbly musicals. Yeah. And I think there's really something to, because if you just watch, if anyone just watched Hairspray or Crybaby and didn't know anything about him at all, they would just be like, Oh, this is like a teeny bopper bubbly movie. You know, it's, this feels like a high school musical, but I, I think it turns into a completely different and more enjoyable film. If you do have a little bit of history, like I remember watching Crybaby when I was quite young and I was just like, it, it was a, a movie that my sister watched, right? Because it had Johnny Depp in it and he, and he had tight pants, but then I'm like, uh, you know, uh, it, it just wasn't for me. But then, you know, going back and and knowing that he did Pink Flamingos and watching Pink Flamingos and and uh, and, and Polyester and all these other films, it's like, oh, okay, this is this is actually not just that. This is a com this opens it up and it's completely something different. And the message becomes very evident. Um, where it's almost like all of his movies, he's like his own MCU because it's just rewarding to to have to see all of his films. Because if you, if you just watch any of them in a vacuum, they don't really like they're not really good. Like you know, like by themselves. But when they're better as a, a cohesive piece to a bigger mural, I don't, I don't think they're better together. But I think you understand what he's going for. I, I think you, you get some context. It was like when I was reading the, the book American psycho and he talked about all these bands like Genesis and Huey Lewis and all this stuff. 
And he said his favorite band is the Talking Heads. I remember I was like, how can somebody whose favorite band is the Talking Heads like Huey Lewis in the news? And then I fucking got it. Yeah. It was just that of a switch flip. And you're like, oh, he's a goddamn phony when he talks about all this popular stuff. You know, just just having that little bit of context kind of told me everything I needed to know about the book and the movie. I feel the same way about I feel like if you watch Pink Flamingos, Cry Baby makes more sense. Yeah. So I don't think it makes Cry Baby a better movie per se, but I think it shows that there's a cynical undertone that isn't really evident if you just take it at face value. So I, I think there's definitely something to be said by uh, enjoying his work as, you know, like a, an entire body of work versus just looking at the films on their individual merits, which is unfortunately what, you know, critics did. So yeah. the fact that he got people to to accept what he was doing with a film like polyester or crybaby you know i, I think because uh, uh, if you look at like the last third of his career serial mom pecker cecil beat him in a dirty shame those are all just kind of a blend right yeah because you got like the the really trashy stuff he did between mondo trasho and desperate living then you have polyester hairspray and crybaby which were just like his like okay i can make a mainstream movie but then, like, Serial Mom and Pecker and Dirty Shame, they're like, all right, I can make a mainstream movie, but it's also just a little weird. So it's all as much as everything kind of flipped between 77 and 81, I feel like you almost divide his career to thirds. Because Serial Mom and Crybaby back-to-back are quite different. They're about as different as Desperate Living and Polyester, if you ask me. Yeah, yeah. And I think he was getting a lot of pressure from from his kind of fan base where it's like you know do another thing do the thing again you know we want another we don't want make another, another pg musical yeah or on the other side of the coin go make another uh you know force another pink flamingos and i think he kind of tried and i and i don't think that i think he would just kind of moved on at that point so that's why i don't think that when he went kind of back to the early wells later on in his career that's why i don't think that it was received as well at least by me and and i know that you know, studios were just like, we don't know what to do with, with this kind of movie. We don't know, you know, we can't, who's going to fund an NC-17 film, you know, in, in 2019? It just doesn't make any money. And he's just like, you know, I, I'm, if you guys want the, you, you want the old John Waters, I'm going to make it to the best of my ability. And I, I just think it kind of fell flat on its face where, I think the best John Waters was was the one, you know, was was the creepy guy with the with the trench coat, you know, where you could walk through a, a shopping mall, but you have ladies' underwear on underneath, and no one knows until someone tells you about it, uh, which <laughs> I, I just think sums up, you know, a John John Waters movie perfectly, especially those more uh, palatable ones to to the to the broader audience. So. I, I don't know. It's just like I, I wish that he would have kind of. I, I think Serial Mom was even though it wasn't liked by critics i think it was kind of that perfect balance where he just went far enough um and, and i mean ming stole is like back in in perfect rare form in that film but uh he just like went far enough but also it was palatable enough for a broader audience to be kind of successful and i think if he went down that road he, he might still be making i mean he's 73 years old but he, he might have made a few more movies after that i I think Serial Mom is probably the closest thing to his vision. Yeah. Because as much as like Hairspray and Crybaby kind of felt like, oh, this is where his love of The Wizard of Oz shows up, right? Because The Wizard of Oz was just bright, colorful sets, you know, great dialogue from villainous women. You know, that's that, that was the kind of shit he liked. But I, I think if you... If you try to combine every element of every movie he's made, I think Serial Mom perfectly encapsulates everything that's John Waters. Every woman wants to be wanted, just not for Murder One. Beverly, I've read all about this. Is it menopause? If you just like went down a checklist, like it's it's got like the cynical skewering of how boring suburbia is and how some people just have to do something you know out of sheer boredom you know it, it's his fascination with uh murder you know it's his fascination with um with how fake suburbia is and 
a charismatic person who gets away with murder. It's um, I don't know. Uh, it, it, it's got Kathleen Turner in like the role she was born to play. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, but it, everyone talks so fake at the breakfast table and talks so fake to each other. But really, you know, they don't like each other necessarily. I just think it's it's probably the the quintessential John Waters movie, I think. And I I, I saw it very young and thought it was hilarious. You know, as violent as it was, I really thought it was funny. So uh, I think it's probably his funniest movie also. Yeah, she she beats someone to death with a, a leg of, of roast or whatever. I, I mean, I, I love the, uh, the the actor's name isn't coming to mind, but but the husband, how he's just literally following her around just like, oh, good, honey, you know, kind of cheering her on, but kind of not also. Like, he looks borderline relieved when she's when she's picked up from the cops but also is like staunchly defending her in court um it, it's just you know e- even someone as close as her own husband doesn't know how to react and, and like you said i think it was like a perfect return to form where on the other side of the co- coin i think cecil b demented is I, I know that was like a cult it has a cult following of its own but i think that was so on the nose as a John Waters film that I I, mm. I, just, I found it almost unwatchable. Like I, I thought that was one of the worst movies um, from him def- overall, but certainly from him where it was just like, it, it just felt like people going, make, make a John Waters film, make a John Waters film. And it was just like, it had the rants in it. Like the whole time, you know, yeah. St- Stephen Dorff is, is going off about, you know, mainstream filmmaking and blah, 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 blah. And it's just like, it just comes off as annoying at that point because you could almost tell that he was already moved on even though he was making the film. Like, he yeah. didn't want to make that shit. Like, <laughs> he was already done with that in his life. And I felt like he was just getting pressured that, you know, so maybe some of those smaller studios were just like, oh, you know, you want money to make a movie, I want a John Waters movie. So that, I think that was really unfortunate. So you don't recognize Law and Order's Sam Waterston? Come on. That's, that's it. <laughs> that's who that was. Yeah. yeah. The consummate, like, I'm holding in a fart face during the entire film. <laughs> <laughs> I loved, like, every time someone's, like, she does anything, he's like, oh, you know. Just looks like he has really bad internal gas. Uh, oh, man. Matthew was... Lillard. Oh, come on. It was just a great film. Yeah. Lillard sucks. Cecil B. Demen, it kind of felt like, he's like, well, if I had... <laughs> Multiple maniacs could, if I could do that over again, you know, Cecil B. Demented, you're right. It felt forced. But it's like, here's two... the 30th anniversary of multiple yeah. maniacs. I'll make a John Waters movie. And it's just like, yeah, you needn't have bothered. You could put those two movie posters up next to each other with Divine's face, like that really tight, unsettling close up of her just maniacally smiling and uh, Melanie Griffith's, uh, you know, the, the, the black and white. And it, it, and it does look like it's supposed to be like a sequel, but it's just so bad. It just misses the mark so bad. And I, and I like some of the performances in it. Like Alicia Witt is, is great and she's gorgeous to look at. And Ricky Lake's funny, but, uh, you know, Kevin Nealon doing his uh, Gump impression. There's some things in there that, that are like chuckle worthy, but it, it just completely misses the mark of what I think it was supposed to do. Well, I, I think maybe part of it was supposed to be romanticizing what it takes to make an indie film. Because yeah. as much as like it, it might not have been for us, you know, if um, if Mondo Trasho was his clerks, <laughs> maybe Cecil De- B. Demented was his uh, Jersey girl. You know, it wasn't for us. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Of course, it wasn't good, but it wasn't for us. Uh, Cecil B. Demented was his love letter to the first couple movies he, and how he had to get them made. And, and <laughs> he didn't have to kidnap an A-lister and make her be in the movie, but <laughs> maybe he would have. Yeah. And maybe he got he was inspired by like what he went through because Pecker was, was sort of like, well, art snobs are the worst, too. Like, as much as, like, the straight culture sucks, art snobs are such pretentious dicks, and Pecker was all about that, you know? They said we couldn't use the title. And I gave, I thought, a pretty good speech, because I've always wanted to be a lawyer, where I said things like, what angry child ever carves the word Pecker in his decks? No sexist men say, suck my Pecker to a woman. Uh, you know, and then I thought, how about Free Willy? 
you allowed that in London. Uh, how about Shaft? And I named all these movies, and they were just looking at me. And then they said, okay. So uh, I, I think Peckard was a... Uh... I think Cecil B. Demand is how you have to follow something like Pecker up. See, I think Pecker was charming, though, and I think it was basically conveying the same message. It was like A-listers versus the everyman. I think Pecker was probably one of his most autobiographical films. Mm-hmm. That was basically just about him. And then you, you know, you take out kind of the you trade the good feels for for uh, mean spirited, you know, black comedy for the sake of being mean spirited and you get Cecil B and I just don't think it it, it works. Yeah, we haven't talked much about Pecker, which I think is too bad because yeah. I really liked it. And yeah. I, I, it, it of the two kind of autobiographical films he made, that's it's clearly the better one and um it's kind of a shame that he sort of I, I liked Edward Furlong and Christina Ricci in this and like the fact that he n- never worked with a lot of these people again kind of sucks. Yeah. But he made one more movie, so right. or two more, so <laughs> he didn't work with a lot of these people ever again. How good was Tracy Lords? Oh man. Right? Yeah. She was perfectly cast in Crybaby, I think. Uh and she and she was great in uh Serial Mom. In Serial Mom too, yeah. Yeah, so Tra- Tracy Lord, don't don't Google Tracy Lord's like adult acting career because there's some weird stuff going on there. But uh, her as an actress, like I, her in like Zach and Mary make a porno, like she's just like really deadpan and funny. And I think like probably the most talent, one of the most talented actresses he he collaborated with, which is oh for sure, really funny to say, right? Well, I mean, the porno that she made was really bad, <laughs> but she was underage too, and that's really bad, also. <laughs> yeah. But like the fact that he needed somebody to be over the top sexy in a like what were the fifties ridiculous sort of way in Crybaby, she was just so perfect for that. Yeah. You know. Let's talk about trading off or, or handing over the baton too, because you know he lost Divine in in the eighties. Yeah. And that kind of and it was it was kind of creepy too because you you literally got to see uh, you, the mother figure as divine and, and then he found Ricky Lake and, and Ricky Lake for all intents and purposes was his new divine it, it, you know that sounds so crazy to say growing up you know in the 90s watching the the literal Ricky Lake show and I remember watching Crybaby back in the day but I, I as a kid I, I didn't really look into John Waters and probably nor should I have uh, it was probably the right move but it's it's just funny to think that this talk show host you know w- were in all these crazy films and did it work? Did it not? I don't know. I, I think she did okay. She, she's definitely no Divine. Like, there was no replacement. There, there was definitely a black hole when when Divine passed away because that was just like lightning in a bottle. I think those two, you know, Divine and John Waters were just... It, the kismet was just off the charts. But then I think Ricky Lake did a, did a pretty good job once he kind of figured out how to use her. Well, he wasn't making Divine movies. He was making Ricky Lake movies. Right. Really, when you think about it, when he made polyester, he's sort of like, yes, okay, now here's what I'm looking for. So, you know, I I think when he traded off, yeah, he divine, you know, is irreplaceable. But at the same time, Ricky Lake wasn't as much of a replacement for divine straight up as sort of like this is the new direction. You know, if you can't have divine anymore, why not build movies around somebody like this? And as much as Ricky Lake is sort of like whatever as an actress, I thought she was really funny in like a lot of Waters movies. And, uh, you know, like seeing her as a straight talk show host, just like being professional. It's kind of <laughs> funny considering just how like goofy she was in, uh, in all of his movies. And I, I think, you know, that was what the, the second half of his career was. He was making Ricky Lake movies. So <laughs> when they had the baton traded off, uh, I think he made stuff that was a little more, you know, bubbly and funny. Kind of like Ricky Lake is unless, you know, Divine's like a dog turd holding a switchblade. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. And Ricky Lake is like a like a kitten in a bubble bath, I guess. <laughs> but like... Still kind of dangerous, but at the same time, very inviting. So, 
Yeah, I, I think he made uh, I think he made Ricky Lake type movies, and I I think it worked really well for him. And um, you know, if he were still making movies, uh, maybe he'd have to have found somebody else, and maybe he would have, like somebody like Aubrey Plaza, maybe or I don't know, yeah. who knows? Yeah, who knows what he'd be up to? Yeah, doesn't but, Aubrey Plaza seem like the new Ming Stoll now? Like, I could totally see that. Except she's not constantly screaming at the camera that she hates the Supreme Court. But, uh, yeah, I think, uh, like... It, I'm not saying that Aubrey Plaza wouldn't hate the Supreme Court. That's, that's true. Uh, she's one of the funniest people working today. Very under understated. Um, but, yeah, I, I think Ricky Lake... It, it, it's funny, too, because even in the movies that weren't Ricky Lake movies, like a Cecil B., I think it's she was the best part of it, even though she's in it for very... For a very short amount of time, but just like when when he did go, kind of full John Waters, you know, never go full John Waters. But when he was going full John Waters in that movie, um, <laughs> it was just like stuff was happening around her, and she's just so wholesome that it just seemed so out of place. And her reaction and her timing was was you know very underrated. Um, I think that her performance in in Hairspray was was fantastic. Like he he, it, it's funny too because you hear. Um, I, I watch a lot of interviews with, with Divine's old makeup artists, and they're just like, you know, at first, what, what do we do with this? How do we create this? And then they're like, you know what? You know, fat is beauty, fat is sex. Like, we're going to display everything that Divine has to offer, everything that's popping out. And the, and that was one of the, the, the things that held over with Ricky Lake, because they're just like, no, Ricky Lake is, is her, we're going to, we're going to showcase her body. She's always like making out with people in, uh, in Serial Mom. Um, she just always plays the over-sexualized person, even though she doesn't look like your stereotypical, like, like a Tracy Lords. And I think that, you know, that was one holdover that they, that they consciously made when they uh went from divine to ricky lake a dirty shame didn't f i don't know it, it it didn't feel like a good last movie i feel i feel like i wish he'd made something else a dirty shame feels like a show that doesn't know it's getting canceled so they do a cliffhanger on their last episode <laughs> and then they never do another season that's how dirty shame felt to me watching it if you know it's the last movie he did and i just sort of just saw it in 2004 assuming it was just another waters movie because i lived um i lived in a college town and there was a, a a video store that we could you know drive to versus just walk into a blockbuster so we would drive there and they had like a whole section for cult stuff and i felt like i gravitated to that stuff so i saw kind of waters movies you know in my early 20s just by the virtue of like all right i'm seeking out cult films so i saw dirty shame and i just always assumed there would be more so it just it felt a little disappointing seeing it because it it was like a little bit like Serial Mom too, like a return to like I feel like the two most purely John Waters movies are A Dirty Shame and Serial Mom, and like a lot of people will say Hairspray and uh, and Cry Baby, but I kind of felt like he made those for other people. I feel like he made these two movies for him. So not, not getting more after a movie that came out 15 years ago is a little bit disappointing. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, he, he stated before that, you know, he wanted to, he'd still be making films today if he could get funding for them. You know, he's not, he can't beg his dad anymore for, for money to make, you know, uh, like a Pink Flamingos. But I think he's, like, if you see him now, he's still just, like, enjoying it, right? Like, he's enjoying what he's done and he gets to kind of reap the benefits from it. Like he, he's, he was in C to Chucky, even, even his role in Alvin and the chipmunks, the road chip, uh, you know, so, something as horrible as that gets a, you know, Alvin says a pink flamingos reference, you know, in a kid's movie, it's like, you know, the, you know, those kids, every, every kid has a, has a cell phone nowadays and they're all looking up, you know, they're all Googling yeah. pink flamingos now. Whew, you know that it's just well. Like, I mean, Alvin could have eaten a chipmunk turd or something like that. They could have <laughs> really been scandalous with it and, and weren't. Yeah. Do you mind I mean, the man, Mama. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's he wrote. Let me look. He wrote five books since he made a Dirty Shame. So that's kind of what he's up to now. And a Dirty Shame made literally two million dollars at the box office the whole time it was in theaters. A John Waters movie. In 2004, when everyone should have known better, didn't go to see it, 
because I don't know, maybe they saw a Johnny Knoxville and they're like, yeah, whatever. I mean, it probably came out in 11 theaters. It made two million bucks. Who cares? So he's he's making he's writing books now because nobody can stop him from doing that, I guess. Right. <laughs> you don't need to convince a, a, a movie studio that people will go to see a weird thing that's upsetting on purpose. You know, you can just write a book and then all your fans will buy it. And he gets to do the talk show circuit. I think it's a real comfortable thing for a man in his 70s to, to be up to now. And as much as I'm disappointed he's not making more movies, I'll take another couple books. I'll take a one-man show. He, uh, I feel like it was on either Netflix or some streaming service. I saw the, the latest one-man show he did, and there was a great quote in it. He said, we need to make books cool again. If you go home with somebody and they don't have any books, don't fuck them. And I thought that was just... Just the funniest, <laughs> the funniest shit, you know? Um, so if, if that's what he's up to now and he's not beholden to anybody else, fine, you know? Because if he made another Cecil B. Demented, I wouldn't be happy a- right. anyway, you know? So exactly. why not pull a Seinfeld and, and, and leave before you wear out your welcome? Yeah, and I think that was that. He was just like, oh, I got one more college try, and he made it, and everyone's like... I think we've moved on because, you know, the like I said before, like I think the gross out humor and all that has kind of evolved into something like, you know, like App- what was the last Apatow movie? Like, we're not even watching that anymore. Like, people literally, you know, jackass, all that stuff. Like, that was that was like the last of that. And, and he was involved in it. Like, he was in a couple episodes. I mean, he, he, he will show up. He, he's like one of those that will just like show up to anything you invite him to. Like he's in a lot of those like uh, VH1, uh, I don't know, I love the the 70s and as like a panel guest, like literally John Waters is just like happy to be there. And I think that even though, you know, again, he said that he would still be making films if he could, <laughs> I think I think he's kind of there's like a relief to that and he's kind of checking off all the bucket list now like he's at 73 years old and at 71 years old he and Mink Stoll just went on a a, a publicized LSD trip you know j- just to see what the effects would be like in their geriatric years no one cry for for uh, John Waters now you know oh it's so sad that he can't make a film he he is like living life to the fullest at this point John Waters looks like a guy who has a lot of coffee table books. Like he just he's such a good guest on like if, he looks like he could lecture you about old cameras or some shit like that. Like he would just know a lot about weird subjects. So like the fact that he like just goes on shows and like does panels and stuff like that. He, he's just one of those guys where like he would just be fascinating to interview and uh, maybe not a great interviewer himself. Um so he's never confirmed this, but I suspect that his love of Little Richard is why he's got that pencil thin mustache. <laughs> it is confirmed. He was his idol, and he actually interviewed him. Yeah, for Playboy, and yeah. it was a total shit show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I saw that. Yeah, like at 43 years old or something, he's like, it was not good. Very uncomfortable. He's one of those guys that like, well, you did a bunch of weird shit. People seem to like you. We'll let you do stuff, you know? We'll let you show up. So if up. you could... Yeah. yeah, if you could show up and do stuff, like why would you make a fucking movie? Yeah, why would you subject yourself to that in your in your late sixties or early seventies? So, like, yeah, as much as I want to selfishly want another movie, he's earned not having to make one. Right. Yeah, I mean, he he's still getting invited to the Tonight Show, uh, and he hasn't made a movie in in over a decade. And that well, he wrote a book. That's why. Yeah, but I mean, that goes. His to book came out this year in like March or April. Right, yeah, Mister Know It All. He's just so interesting. Like, yeah, he's just one of the. He's just one of those people that have have seen it all, done it all, and you just want to talk to him about it. Whether he has a book or a movie or anything going on, like he always makes a fantastic guest. And, and, and I think you said like probably not a good interviewer because he's always going to be more entertaining than whoever you know he's going to be interviewing anyway. So, uh, it, it it's great. I, I want to see him on the screen for as long as I, you know, as long as his, his, he could hold up. Uh, hopefully all the, uh, the hallucinogens are, are preserving him well enough to, to the eighties and, and beyond. Well, those keep your mind limber, right? Like <laughs> regimen and LSD is, uh, it's going to keep those amyloid plaques from forming. Good. Exercise. I made that up, but that sounds like it could be a thing. If nothing else, like he, whether he wanted to or not, and the dreamlanders wanted to or not, they really, 
pioneered a certain style of filmmaking. Uh, and, and even though they were just kind of messing around, they really pushed cinema and, and jump-started cinema in, in a way where it, 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 they left this lasting impact, these couple of kids in, uh, in um, Baltimore. And just having that kind of impact for, for other people that have gone on to win, you, you know, more traditional filmmakers like a David O. Russell uh, or, or even a little less traditional filmmakers like a David Lynch or a, um, a Jim Jarmusch, just the fact that he kind of helped them on their journey and then seeing what they've created too, it, it, it's just uh, that, that can't be under, that, that can't be understated because even though if a John Waters film isn't for you, and again, it probably isn't for most, at least you have to appreciate the man and, and what he has done in, in Hollywood in general. He's a legend. He's uh, incredibly influential, and um, he laid down on the barbed wire of censorship and you know being <laughs> hounded by the establishment so that other people could come after him and make weird shit. So, you know, he was a pioneer, and uh, he took a lot of heat so the rest of us could do what we wanted. Yeah, absolutely. So that is this episode of Director's Cut. If you want to listen to this in podcast form, why don't you go ahead and go over to, you know, we're on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio. I know that one's a very important one. Uh, all those cool things. So, you, you know, if you don't want to be stressed out by having to look at our faces, you could just listen to our sultry voices. But, yeah, uh, Jason Alt, my my consummate co-host, where can everyone find you, sir? If you check me out on the Twitter at Jason E. Alt, I have a pin post where I talk about my many other projects. And uh, thanks so much for checking out this episode. Yeah. And you can find me right here on this very channel, They Said, We Said, or on all the other uh, podcasting platforms by the same name. You could also uh, follow us on Twitter at cut underscore director. If you want to follow me personally, I'm at Orzov Dunn. Uh, but until next time... Uh, go drink more pink drinks. I don't know. I'm going to chug, chug more of this uh, horrible rosé. We, I think we have to inspire people. So I really think that gay men and women, you should make a New Year's resolution this year to only blow teachers. Wouldn't that be nice, really? And then teachers will be freshly blown and satisfied, and they will try harder to really interest our students and our young people today.